July 14, 1828, Southwestern Oregon. As the initial rays of sunlight struggled their way through the dense forest canopy and vaporous morning fog, finally reflecting on the rippling waters of the Umpqua River, a group of four men prepare to cast off in their dugout canoe. Their intention is to find a more passable route of travel rather than the circuitous, marshy path they had found themselves on in the last few days. Three of the men are part of a 15 to 20 person band of fur trappers making their way north to Fort Vancouver in hopes of trading some of the fruits of their labors for some much needed supplies, horses, and a respite from the omnipresent threats presented by the wilds of the Pacific Northwest. For them, the conditions presented by their current environs are at once shakingly unfamiliar and tranquilizingly routine. They had been making their way across the American West for the better part of two years, from St. Louis, across the Salt Lake Desert, the Mojave Desert, over the Sierra Nevadas, and up from Southern California to Northern California, and then on to Oregon. They had seen all manner of hardships along the way, from grizzly attacks to hostile Mexican government officials to attacks from hostile native tribes. Less than a year earlier, some of these men had been among the few survivors to emerge from an attack by the Mojave tribe in the austere, Joshua tree-strewn desert that bears their name. They hailed from all manners of backgrounds and ethnicities, though most were American Protestants from states like Pennsylvania, Virginia, Ohio, and New York. Though their diversity in culture and experience makes their collective categorization all but impossible, it is safe to say that none among them had seen wilderness like what they had encountered in the previous few weeks. They had made their way up from the San Joaquin Valley in central California, northwest through giant redwoods to the northern California coast. They had hung close to the coastline, staying as close to the water as possible during the low tide and moving back up toward the timber as the water level necessitated. As they made their way north, they found the terrain and the native tribes less and less hospitable. The fourth man in their crew, though, felt right at home as they paddled up the frigid river lined with Oregon white oaks. He was a member of the Umpqua tribe, an umbrella group of several smaller subgroups, all of which had resided here in the Umpqua Valley for generations. Specifically, he was a member of the Lower Umpqua Band. The etymology of the word Umpqua is thought to trace back to a word from their neighbors to the south the Talawa tribe. It is theorized to mean a place along the river, or thundering water, or dancing water, or bring across the river. They spoke the Siuslaw language, lived in cedar plank houses, and survived by both hunting and fishing in forests, streams, and ocean inlets in their home territory. They were also, like most tribes in North America at this point, increasingly impacted and influenced by the encroachment of Europeans and North Americans in their homelands. Like most tribes along the Northern California and Southern Oregon coastal ranges, the Umpqua were not averse to violent retaliation in response to trespassing in their territory. But they were not averse to making their lives easier either. However masterful the Umpqua, and for that matter any native tribe, may have been as woodsmen life for them was still incredibly difficult. Not only was hunting made easier with firearms, but cleaning and dressing the animal were often easier with steel knives than with stone tools. Falling trees and splitting firewood was a far less laborious task when using a steel axe obtained from the whites. Though beads made from seashells and bones were indeed beautiful, the glass beads from the European and American traders could be garnered in a wider array of colors and a far greater quantity. Medicines, foodstuffs, blankets, fabrics, and gunsmithing services were all highly valued goods and services that most tribes could procure through few if any other sources than via trading with the whites. This led to an unavoidable mixing of cultures and a variety of cultural, economic, and military alliances. Though clashes were frequent throughout the West, as had been the case for the trapping party in the preceding weeks, the prevailing rule was that the enemy of one's enemy was one's friend. Many in the modern world often create a fundamental false binary of simply whites versus natives, when this does a fundamental disservice to both groups. 
the native tribes from Alaska to Argentina lived in harsh, conflict-ridden worlds in which life was a constant struggle for resources and safety. Just as in the modern world, pragmatism often won out over cultural purity in the interest of survival. Though this party of mountain men were clearly and presently trespassers in Umpqua territory, they could perhaps serve more utility as allies than enemies, or so the Umpqua had initially thought. And, for their part, nothing would have made the mountain men happier, though many among them were certainly partial to the ardent nationalism of the early 19th century, almost all were cultural and economic pragmatists first and foremost. Their goal was not to acquire territory, nor to entice the native tribes into a fight. Quite the contrary, their endeavors were essentially purely economic in nature, and thus many mountain men prided themselves on their ability to navigate the turbulent waters between such wildly different cultures. This was especially true for the leader of this party, the young but already legendary Jedediah Strong Smith. Though he was only 29 years old, he had already spent a decade of his life in the wilds of the American West. He had been born in 1799 in what is today Bainbridge, New York, to Jedediah Smith Sr. and Sally Strong, longtime New Englanders of staunch puritanical stock. The family moved to Erie County, Pennsylvania when Smith was still a boy, and by age 13, his innate thirst for adventure led him to find a job as a clerk on a Lake Erie freighter. Here, he came across a number of frontiersmen and fur trappers, many under the employ of the Hudson Bay Company. Thoroughly regaled with tales of daring, adventure, and riches had from capitalizing on Europe's obsessive demand for New World furs, Smith set out for St. Louis at the age of 17, and by 1822, census information shows him living in the burgeoning, though doubtless still austere, frontier city. Here, his hopes of obtaining employment with a fur company expedition were realized when he, along with 99 other adventure-hungry young men, answered a newspaper ad in the Missouri Gazette. The ad was posted by General William H. Ashley, another eventually legendary figure in the history of the mountain men and fur trade in the American West. General Ashley called for 100 enterprising young men to head northwest to the Rockies in search of beaver pelts that were used to make the hats now so in vogue in London taverns and Paris cafes. In the spring of 1823, the company, known to history as Ashley's 100, left St. Louis and Jedediah left his old life behind forever. He had risen quickly through the loose commandatory hierarchy of the fur trapping companies, comporting himself with courage and composition time and again under the duress of frustration, starvation, thirst, and combat. He had seen countless close friends die in violent ways, endured seemingly endless travel and privation, and seen his boyish good looks scarred forever after narrowly surviving an attack from a grizzly bear. Through it all, Smith had been noted for his moderation, his piety, his reliability, and his skill as a woodsman, marksman, and trapper. Now though, as he found himself seated in a canoe next to his Umpqua guide and trapper compatriots, Jed Smith was tired. He had come thousands of miles, seen so much, and yet still had not managed to acquire the financial success he had hoped to nearly a decade ago. As the iridescently haunting rays of sunlight began to poke more and more holes in the forest canopy, one can imagine the deep sense of fatigue that must have set in as Smith surmised his current situation in its totality. He and his men were all travel-weary, within striking distance of starvation, and summarily weakened in both body and mind. The preceding days had been worryingly turbulent, and they must have weighed heavily on his mind. He and his men had encountered the Umpqua a few days earlier, in a trade meeting that encapsulated the terse, uncertain, an all-too-human nature of Native and Euro-American interactions spanning from the 1400s to the 21st century. Having spotted some Umpqua sentries at a distance, Smith and his party made signs to parlay and initiate trade in hopes of both restoring their supplies and building an amicable relationship. 
Unlike their Spanish predecessors and American successors, this party of trappers hoped not to conquer or colonize, but merely to peacefully pass through on their way to Fort Vancouver. Even the most ardent extoller of the virtues of manifest destiny among them will concede that now, with a party of not quite two dozen objectively overworked and severely undernourished trappers, was not the time nor the place to attempt a conquest of any kind. The Umpqua, who at this point in history rarely saw any white men, were simultaneously wary, curious, and confused. And given even a cursory glance at the territorial geopolitics all along the western coast at the time, but specifically in California and Oregon, it is quite understandable why. Though California had long been ostensibly under the control of the Spanish, the English and the Russians had, at this point, spent decades making forays into the ocean inlets and mountainscapes of the Pacific Northwest in hopes of laying claim to its innumerable resources in both flora and fauna. Private interests such as the Hudson Bay Company had also spent small fortunes on incursions deep into the unknowns of the region in hopes of establishing networks of native tribes and collecting intelligence on any potential natural boundaries to be had. In the Treaty of 1818, the United States and Britain, awash in the geocentric hubris of the time, agreed to share exploratory custody of a territory that was not theirs to begin with. Regardless, in the intervening decades, the Umpqua and their neighbors had seen a marked increase in the frequency and size of the expeditionary parties making their incursions into the territory. They had been intermittently accepting of and hostile to such incursions but in recent months had warmed to the idea of building amicable relations with white traders in hopes of fortifying their own wealth. Jedediah Smith and his party had hoped to capitalize on this, though their interactions with the Umpqua's neighbors to the south had been terse at best and violent at worst up until now. However, seeing the only prudent course of action as taking the most amicable route, Smith intended to make some good trades and build at least some usable amount of rapport with their reluctant, suspicious hosts. The two parties had convened the mountain men's camp on the west side of the bend in the river. At first, the mood was suspicious. However, after some initial offers and counteroffers, both sides began to relax, and a sense of reserved joviality seemed to prevail. Then, one of the men informed Jedediah Smith that an axe and a skinning knife had gone missing from the party's supplies. It was apparent that, if one of the trappers had not taken the missing items, one of the Umpqua had. Though known for his magnanimity and charity in such situations, Smith had learned through the incessant native thievery that had plagued his party since the Dakotas that no amount of charity would render the goods returned. And so he saw fit to employ more forceful measures. The suspected Umpqua was detained by Smith and two others, tied up and interrogated as to the whereabouts of the axe and knife. For hours, the suspected Umpqua denied any and all knowledge of the missing items. Interestingly though, even during this time, trading continued amongst a number of smaller parties in which the hungry trappers bartered for shellfish and berries the Umpqua had brought to trade. Finally though, the axe was found amongst the detained Umpqua's effects, though the knife never was, and he was free. Though he was indeed guilty of the theft, this particular Umpqua was a chief amongst his people and now felt much aggrieved at his treatment by these American interlopers. He retreated across the river and complained to his fellow chiefs, demanding some kind of retributory action be taken in defense of his honor. The most senior chief in the group dissuaded him from this pursuit, though, arguing that he had not been so egregiously assaulted as to merit the killing of the trappers. However, it would be only a short time later when that same chief, having re-engaged in trading with the trapping party, was himself offended. The two conflicting accounts of what happened next are as follows. In the Umpqua's recounting, the chief in question thought it would be greatly amusing to write about the camp on one of the fine mounts in possession of the trappers. The trapper who owned the horse ordered him off at gunpoint, and a fight then and there was narrowly avoided. In the trapper's account, the chief was in no uncertain terms directed to dismount, but no kind of firearm was brandished. 
Despite the disparity in accounts, in either case, an immediate confrontation was avoided. The Umpqua met again across the river and decided that immediate retribution was still not the most prudent answer, and so the auspices of normality with the trappers should be maintained. Hence, the Umpqua who had agreed to guide Smith and his cohorts upriver agreed to stay at the campsite with them in order to leave the next morning. Before his companions left, though, plans were made for exacting the revenge the Umpquas felt to be rightfully theirs. Ostensible agreements were made to resume trading the next day, and the trappers fell into preparing their meals and readying themselves for a night's sleep. Jedediah Smith had his suspicions as to the Umpqua's intent, but could do little more than feign normality and carry on with the evening's tasks. With his small force against the several dozen Umpqua, here in the middle of nowhere, any attempt at an offensive attack would likely result in their small party being overrun. Though there is no record of it, Smith may have conferred with his more senior party members as to the most plausible courses of action. But no determined defensive plan was set in place, nor were the men notified of any suspected heightened threat. However, the next morning, as Smith and company warily paddled their canoe around a bend in the river and out of sight, many in the camp were still asleep. In the succeeding hour or so, many would wake up and begin their morning tasks of checking their equipment and procuring themselves some breakfast before setting about the more laborious tasks of their day. Smith, Leland, and Turner, along with their guide, carried out their intended mission of scouting out a more desirable route to travel. As they made their way back, they paddled with the vigor of men looking forward to a hearty breakfast after a hard morning's work. Then, just as they approached the bend in the river around which they had disappeared earlier that morning, they heard a riotous commotion coming from the camp, still hidden from view. As Smith, Leland, and Turner conferred with each other as to what the cause might be, the Umqua guide snatched Smith's rifle and in one deft, intentional motion, tipped the canoe over, spilling them all into the river. The Umqua swam to the western bank, while Smith, Leland, and Turner made it to the eastern bank just in time to take cover from a volley of fire coming from a hidden group of Umquas their former canoe mate had swum to for cover. They made their way to the top of a low promontory overlooking their campsite from across the river and were greeted with a scene that must have haunted their nightmares for the remainder of their lives. All of the men in camp were now dead. Only minutes before their arrival, as their friends and comrades were still waking, a force of 200 Umqua had overrun the camp. Some of the men had been cooking breakfast, some cleaning their weapons, and some were still asleep in their blankets when they were fell upon and cut down in a matter of minutes by Umpqua war clubs, hatchets, and arrows. Smith and company could only watch on as the aftermath unfolded in which all of their belongings, including furs they had worked two years in acquiring, were either stolen or destroyed. Their livestock milled about nervously made skittish by the sudden commotion and iron scent of blood. Eventually, they too were taken by the Umpqua. One man, Moses Black, had managed to dive into the river and escape his pursuers. According to his later account, he had been cleaning his rifle when two Umpqua appeared, seemingly out of nowhere, and demanded he relinquish his weapon to them. Black had refused, and after a short tussle, he had turned and ran after being slashed across the back, by the Umpqua's knives. He had managed to jump into the river and avoid the arrows and rocks that rained down around him, making it to the eastern bank of the river and escaping. On his flight to the river, he had seen Thomas Virgin being hacked to pieces by a pair of Umpqua warriors and another trapper, whom he believed to be Thomas Dawes, being chased down by a group of Umpqua in a canoe. Smith, Leland, and Turner, however, had no knowledge of Black's escape, and thus both parties, Smith and company as well as Moses Black, believed themselves to be the sole survivors of the massacre. However, regardless of their communication breakdown, the only viable destination for any trapper lost in that hostile country was to make their way north, as the party had originally intended, to Fort Vancouver. A torturous hike of roughly 200 miles up rocky shoreline and through unforgiving woodlands that would be incredibly taxing for even fit, well-fed individuals. 
It would not be until August 8th that Moses Black would struggle to the gates of Fort Vancouver. He was half dead and being nearly carried by a kindly Tillamook native who had taken it upon himself to guide the starving, desperate man to his destination. At first, Black could not bring himself to speak, so shaken were his nerves. The commander of the fort ordered the gates opened and for the clearly traumatized man to be brought in and cared for. After being wrapped in blankets and given a warm drink, Black was able to still his nerves long enough to articulate the horrors of his plight. A retributive excursion was immediately planned by the fort's commander, Captain John McLaughlin. Runners were sent out to the surrounding tribes, notifying them that a handsome reward would be paid to any natives who brought in survivors of the recently perpetrated massacre. The next day at around noon, Smith, Leland, and Turner staggered to the gates of the fort, themselves in little better condition than Moses Black. They too had procured Tillamook guides after making their way roughly 120 miles up the coast. Though both Black and Smith's party were all thrilled to learn that they were not, in fact, the sole survivors of the massacre, their cross-referencing of accounts also confirmed the sad truth that there were no other survivors. This, as in so much of the history of the Old West, is also a matter of some dispute in differing accounts. Umpqua accounts speak of two native women who were traveling with the party and were left unharmed, even eventually marrying into the tribe. Though they were not mentioned in any of Smith's journal entries, nor in the accounts of his contemporaries, that does not mean the Umpqua accounts were untrue. It would not have been uncommon for parties of trappers to provide either employment or safe travel to local tribespeople as their comparatively sizable and well-armed contingent made their way through the territory. However, we do know that every single trapper present other than Smith, Leland, Turner, and Black was killed there at the campsite on the Umpqua River. Their names were Thomas Dawes, John Gaither, Abraham LaPlante, Emmanuel Lazarus, Touchant Marichal, Martin McCoy, Joseph Palmer, Peter Ranney, Harrison Rogers, Charles Swift, Thomas Virgin, a former slave known as Ranza, and perhaps most tragically, Marion, the Indian boy whom they had taken into their party, by some accounts forcefully, in order to provide him with either protection, use him for labor, or both. All died tragically violent, terrifying deaths under a dark forest canopy thousands of miles from most of their homes. Smith left only two written accounts of the attack, one to his brother and another to William Clark. Both are relatively terse in nature, and though sorrow is undoubtedly expressed on Smith's behalf, the veneer of his imperturbability remained uncracked. Undoubtedly, though, Smith and the other survivors were all psychologically traumatized and burning for revenge. Smith was informed by a sympathetic Captain McLaughlin that all would be done within his power to restore what property he could of Smith's, but that marshalling an all-out assault on the Umquas was highly imprudent and thus out of the question. Crestfallen and physically depleted, Smith, Black, Leland, and Turner would eventually recover enough to make their way southeast to the yearly mountain man rendezvous in present-day Wyoming. Smith would eventually make his way back to St. Louis, and after a short-lived retirement from the mountain man life, find himself on the Cimarron River in present-day Kansas. It would be here, in 1831, that Jedediah Smith, legendary mountain man, would meet his end at the hands of the dreaded Comanche. But that, like the plethora of other harrowing stories from Jed Smith's short but remarkable 32-year life, is another story for another time. But what do you think? Were Smith and company the victims of a misunderstanding, or did they reap the just deserts of intruders in foreign lands? Were the Umpqua justified in their attack, or could diplomacy have prevailed? Let us know what you think in the comments. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and ring that notification bell, and if you'd like to support our work, you can become a monthly contributor on Patreon, link included below. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, History Too Real for the Westerns.